Hey guys, Andrew Esquivel here back with another tutorial. Today I'm going to be showing you how to build a computer completely from scratch. Now for those of you wondering, I am CompTIA A Plus certified, Network Plus certified, Security Plus certified, and I am also certified by the College of DuPage as a microcomputer servicing technician. So, first off, in order to build a computer we need a list of parts. Now there's actually not too many parts involved in building a computer, so we're going to go over that. First off, we need a case. Our case of choice, and the one that I recommend, is the Cooler Master High Airflow. This case, when you get the full size case, is going to pretty much hold just about any motherboard you can throw at it. It's, it is going to be able to hold uh, a number of configurations, including your water cooling configurations. It has a number of 230 millimeter fans on the top, the side, the fronts, and also a large 120 millimeter fan on the back. When it comes to picking out a case, one thing you want to remember is that exhausting hot air is actually more important than intaking cool air. When you have air inside the computer, the components need to be cooled off. Circulating hot air is not good. So getting rid of the hot air is going to actually create a pressure flow that's going to intake cold air anyway. However, having the best of both worlds is actually going to be the best result. So that's why I like the hot. So, that's going to be our case. Next part we're going to go over is uh, the power source. Now for our power supply we have chosen a 1000 watts platinum rated power supply. Now when it comes to power supplies there's a number of choices you can get. And the reason we chose platinum rating is uh, actually for uh, something that most people don't realize with the power supplies. Now energy is quite a funny thing. You can get a 1000 watt power supply and there's different ratings for efficiencies that people just seem to overlook. There's bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And what that basically means is you can have a thousand watts of power, but a lot of that power can be lost in heat. So if you're running at peak load, which is a thousand watts in this case, you're losing a lot of that power in heat. So realistically, you will not achieve a thousand watts. So these efficiency ratings tell you how much power you're losing in heat. So the higher the efficiency, not only the less power you're losing and the less electricity you're using, but the more stable your rig is going to be. So if you're looking for a high-end rig, try going for platinum rating. Bronze rating is okay, but platinum is going to be your best bet. So that's why we've chosen a platinum rated power supply. What you'll also notice is that we've gone with a modular power supply. This is also important for cooling purposes. See, when we have the power supply in the case, we have all these wires running around, creating basically just a bunch of blocked space. And this isn't good for airflow, because when the air is trying to move, it's going to go from front to back, and it can't do that very well when the wires are in the way. So, Having a modular power supply allows us to take out the wires we don't need and by doing that we reduce the amount of clutter and random amounts of space used up to prevent airflow. Okay, so now we're going to go over the motherboard. Now, the motherboard is basically the component in which you connect all the other components to. For our motherboard we have chosen the ASUS Maximus 5 Extreme. Now, we're going to basically kind of go over a basic rundown of what everything connects into. So, the CPU gets connected into here, the RAM gets put into all these slots over here, your GPU can be put into any of these red slots or even this big black slot here, and as well as any of your other PCI Express devices can be plugged into any of these PCI Express slots, including this little black one here which happens to be a PCI Express four times. So, um, obviously there's many, many other connections to go over on this motherboard, but we'll get to that when we cross that bridge. So, uh, moving on from there, we just talked about RAM, which is our next piece. This is 32 gigabytes of RAM split into four different sticks running at 1600 megahertz in the form of DDR3. Uh, next we're going to go over our hard drive. This is basically what stores all your permanent storage. 
we have chosen a Western Digital Velociraptor 10,000 RPM hard drive with one terabyte of storage. Next, we have our GPU. This is a Gigabyte 7950 from AMD. Um, the reason I say from AMD instead of ATI is because, as many of you know, AMD had bought out ATI a number of years ago. So um, anything from the 6000 series and up is considered AMD. So uh, we have the triple fan version, so the cooling is a bit better. For our CPU, we have chosen the Core i7-3770K. Now, this particular CPU, as do many CPUs that come from Intel, come with a heatsink, as long as you don't order it OEM. If you order it retail, they generally have a mediocre heatsink, and they get you by, but I don't particularly like those. So, to replace that, we have gone ahead and bought ourselves one of the best air coolers on the market, which is the Noctua D14. As you can see, it is a rather large heatsink, and this will require a backplate. So, if you're not familiar with that, we will go over that as well. So, that's basically all the parts right there. The only thing left to do now is to put it together. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to install the backplate on the motherboard. Now, the reason why we install a backplate on the motherboard for the heatsink is because the heatsink is actually quite massive in this case. Now, it's not always required to install a backplate, but because if you look at the heatsink, it's pretty large, and thus, it is quite heavy. It's pretty safe to assume that if it comes with a backplate, you absolutely must install it. But before we do anything, we're going to talk about properly grounding ourselves to make sure we don't do anything involving static. So in order to do that, we wear what we call an ESD band. Basically, it prevents the transfer of electrostatic discharge from our body to the components in the computer. You wear it on your wrist and you connect this to a solid metal part of the computer. Alternatively, if you do not have that option or you're transporting a part or components to a different area, you can use this, which is an ESD safe glove. Essentially, it prevents the transfer of ESD from your hands to a components. However, using this makes things like uh, a delicate operation is a little bit more cumbersome. So it's sometimes preferred to use the ESD band. So moving on, as far as backplates go, it can actually be the hardest part of the entire operation. So this is the backplate. Now it's a solid chunk of metal on one side and it's rubberized on the other side. And there's a good reason why it's rubberized. You see, if we flip the back side of this motherboard, in which is the part where it will be installed, you can see that it's basically just a bunch of solder and metal. It's rubberized so that when this is laying down, it does not short circuit any connections. Now, there is no single one way to put a backplate on because every CPU heatsink that requires a backplate has a slightly different process to do that. That's why they all come with instructions. Now every instruction is going to tell you to do something a little differently depending on if you're uh, installing it on AMD or Intel and even then it varies from let's say Intel's different socket types. Now, I'm not going to go over, over every specific for our particular build. Just know that when you do this, you must read the instructions. So I'm going to kind of just give you a general rundown of what I'm going to do. In our case, we start out with these two pieces. Now this and this kind of go together. And these are labeled. Mine go in B and they sit flush. 
And we do this for all four corners. Now keep in mind that these do come in parts of coupled in small bags. Because of this, parts can get lost. So try your best to make sure they don't go flying around everywhere. Your ESD band can kind of whip around a bit and cause this issue. You don't want that. So making sure we've got everything all in the right spot, checking, double checking, and triple checking, and what have you. We see that we've got the little screws in just the way we want it. So now we line it up with these holes. Now you'll notice there's these four holes. In most cases with Intel, as we've said before, it comes with a heat sink when you buy their CPUs retail. They come with a push pin style on the heat sink. And basically, when the motherboard is flipped out around, the reverse of what you see right now, you just push it in, push it in, push it in, push it in, you're good. It locks into place. Because of the back plate situation, it's not that simple. So knowing that we have to deal with this, we line these up. And they all go in the four holes, and they sit flush. Now, it'll be a little, a little free-floating, and that's okay. So now that we've got that situation all nice and hunky-dory, we're going to flip it back on over. Now, one thing I will say is because of the case we're using, it's not always necessary to put the backplate in first, because our case does have a backplate hole. However, due to the massive size of the heatsink, it may actually be beneficial to do it like this. Now, thank you, assistant. Because these can fall out if you don't have something in the back of it, it's beneficial to have something holding it. If you don't have an assistant, this can be an issue. So next step, we have our spacers. Now obviously, we need these spacers because we don't want our heatsink sitting too close to the heatsink, or to the CPU. So we uh, put them in, one at a time, like so. Voila. Okay, now that we got the spacers on, we're going to put some more brackets in place. Now, it's important that you line these brackets up accordingly. So, in our case, it's once again going to be brackets B, which is our middle sections. All right. Now, our Noctua D14 did come with a screwdriver. Now, we're going to place this special type of screw on top to hold it firmly. And we're not going to screw it too firmly in place quite yet. We're going to make sure both of these are screwed in. We're going to do it by hand first and then by the screwdriver. If you have your own screwdriver, feel free to use that. This works just as well. Do not over tighten anything because then you risk damaging the motherboard. You don't really necessarily need a torque wrench, but just get it to the point where you start to feel a little bit of resistance. Resistance is not futile, but it's just what you need. All right, and you basically just repeat the same process for the other side. We're just screw them in both by hand at first. 
Make sure they get in nice and evenly. Make sure the holes are lined up to the correct one you need. Screw it in so you feel a little bit of resistance. Not too much resistance. And there you go. You now have your back plate installed and we can continue with the rest of the build. Okay, next thing we're going to do is we're going to install the CPU. In order to do that in an Intel motherboard that we just that's brand new, we need to take out the fake plate. Now, there's going to be a latch and the latch is actually controlled by a little lever. It pops out like that. Basically, you push down, you pull to the side, and you undo. And it's going to actually push it upwards and above, or basically that way. <laughs> and we're going to remove the fake plate. And the plate can be a little annoying to remove, but um, it does pop out. So once we got it popped out, you'll notice that there's this bolt right here that essentially keeps the latch on. You just kind of keep pulling the lever and it pops open. And then we see our beautiful land grid array, which is what LGA stands for. It's where we put the CPU. And before we do anything, it is keyed. There are notches here and here that make sure that you cannot put the CPU in the wrong way. So, once again, before we do anything, we check to make sure that we are hooked up to our ESD band. So we got our brand new CPU, our Core i7-3770K. And we're going to open this puppy up. So these things have a kind of really nice sealed in adhesive. So we're going to use a knife to open that up. We open up the box, and this is what I was talking about, folks. It comes with a heatsink. Now, let's do a quick comparison on this heatsink for you. This is the standard heatsink. It's not very impressive, is it? Now, like I said, this is a very simplistic heatsink. It already has thermal compound on the bottom of it, and it has these pushpin type connectors. You basically line up the holes, you push these pins in, you plug up the fan to the power source on the motherboard, and it's good to go. It's simple, but it's not very good. That's why we have the Noctua. So, we're going to throw this on the side. We're not even going to use it. In the box is the CPU. Try not to touch the top of the CPU, because we want to keep it as shiny as possible. Because technically, the reason we use thermal compound is to fill up the gaps in between the CPU and the heat sink at a microscopic level. This creates a good connection between the two in order to dissipate heat from the heat sink or from the CPU to the heat sink. So this is our nice little CPU. And although it's got a little bit of I'm not actually touching it, this is still in the plastic case. The inside of it should be nice. And you'll notice actually that the heatsink has got a mirror finish on, the, on the, uh, the bottom of it. And you can actually make it even better by a process called lapping the heatsink. You shouldn't lap the CPU itself though, because that could damage the CPU. Although I have seen people do it successfully, I do not recommend it. Lapping the heatsink actually requires some skill and a lot of time, and in some cases, a beer. So we're going to place this in nice, and if you could zoom in for me, cameraman, on the spot where I'm about to place this in. Just let me know. Give me a thumbs up when you're good. Okay. I'm going to place this in nice and gently. And you'll see it doesn't require any pressure. pressure. It just lines up. 
Okay? And once again, I'll point out that it's keyed right here and right here. So, we're going to now put the plating back on. And although it's a little bit in the way, we're going to replace our latch. And although, yes, it does have some pressure, don't be too afraid. It's supposed to. It keeps it in place. It's good now. It's secure. It's in there. It's going to be fine. Now, we're going to put the heat sink on top onto its mounting brackets. And then, we're going to put the motherboard into the case. Okay, so one thing I want to note about what we just did off of camera is you'll notice the orientation of this uh, plate right here has slightly changed. And the reason for that is uh, this heat sink can be orientated in a couple of different ways. Originally, when it was placed uh, 90 degrees from what it was, you could have it like this, but the fans would then be placed up and down. We switched it 90 degrees so that the fans would then be placed 90 degrees of its original orientation, making it go left and right. So doing so is a simple switch, and yes, it is meant to do that. So before we put the heat sink on, it is imperative that you put thermal compound on top of the heat sink. Now, the Noctua D14 comes with NTH1 thermal compound. However, I happen to be a fan of the MX series thermal compound, and I have been using MX3 thermal compound for a while now, as well as MX2. MX4 is the newest release of this series, so we're going to be using that. Now, I have also used Arctic Silver 5 thermal compound, and yes, I know people swear by Arctic Silver 5. Some people do say Arctic Silver 5, because of its high silver content, has the possibility of shorting out components if it gets in the wrong spot. I've heard people contest this argument, and I've heard it been argued both ways. Nevertheless, I just simply like MX4 because of its properties. It does a good job, and I know it's reliable. Also, because of its, uh, the way it's uh, put together, it, it lasts a long time. Uh, Arctic Silver 5 does need to be replaced every once in a while. This doesn't need to be replaced as often, and it has almost just as good, if not better, performance from what I've seen. So, uh, the big question and big mistake that people make with this stuff is, how much do you put on the heat sink? You just need the drop of a rice grain, and here's why. You put it in the center of the heat sink, or, I'm sorry, you put it on the center of the CPU. When you put the heat sink on top, it squishes it and it spreads out. You only need a thin layer because you're only really trying to fill the microscopic cracks on top of the metal plate of the CPU. That's why it's there. So, we're going to take off the cap, and it's just going to be a paste. You can get stuff from Zalman, which is kind of a liquid. And it may work a little better, but I don't particularly care for that kind of stuff. So, because this is a syringe, we kind of just plunge it. We just put a little bit on there. So, cameraman, if you could do me a favor and just zoom in on that for me. We're going to show you exactly what that is supposed to look like. And even then, that's a generous helping. Okay, so now we're actually going to put the heat sink mounted to the brackets. Now, the reason we're going to do this before we're putting it into the case is because we've already measured everything beforehand, and we know that we can, in fact, screw the motherboard into the case without any problems, even though the size of this heat sink is massive. Now, there are heat sinks that are actually much bigger than this, and in some cases, that's, you just can't do that. But in our case, we can. So we're going to line up the holes, and when you do this, try to make sure that you get it done right the first time. Because if you put it down and then pull it back up, you create air bubbles in the thermal compound. And it's a good idea to not have that happen. So we're going to try and get it right the first time. And this nice long screw that Noctua gave us is going to come in handy. And 
don't be too frustrated with yourself if it doesn't catch immediately. And it feels like we caught it on one side. And we're going to see if we can catch it on the other side now. And yes, keep in mind, there is going to be some pressure in this case. I just need to catch the screw. More pressure. And I know it seems a little freaky that we're giving it so much pressure. But sometimes it's just how these things work. And we're good. You can release now, Jason. Thank you very much. And we just need enough to get these screws in. And some people think that they're going to break the motherboard. But these things, especially this one, it's pretty tough. And we want to go a little bit at a time on each one. And you notice that we didn't pick it back up. It slid around just a tiny bit. And that's not so bad. That's okay. Picking it back up is what creates those micro bubbles. That's not Gusta. That's quite anti Gusta if you're going to overclock. And we don't want to over tighten it. We just want to get it to the point where these springs have some tension. Okay. So now we got the heat sink all mounted on the brackets. And now what we're going to do is we're going to install the motherboard inside the case and then we're going to put the fans in. And the reason we're going to do that is because the fans are actually quite large. One of them is larger than 120 millimeters. And because of that, that's what's going to be what's getting in the way of screwing the motherboard into the case. So now what we're going to do is we're going to shift the camera over and we're going to put it into the case. Okay, now when you buy a motherboard retail, it often comes with a lot of different accessories and parts you're going to need to hook it up to the rest of the computer. In our case, ours came with a nice assortment of cables and whatnot in this box. So we've got some USB connections. We've got some SLI Crossfire expansion and cover a couple of other accessories and whatnot and right now for all intents and purposes the necessities is going to be this the IO shield so we're going to put all this aside for now just so we can get this put together now the IO shield is basically what's Make sure dust doesn't get in from the back side of your computer through the paneling. So anyone who's plugged anything into the back of the computer knows that this is there. So basically, in this hole, you put the I.O. shield. So if my cameraman would gently take the camera out from its mounting so we can get a better angle, You'll see the IO shield goes into this section right here. And you also see that it lines up with the motherboard in these holes. So make sure you put it in correctly because it is a rectangle and rectangles can kind of go in either way. It's kind of a pain in the butt to get in and out. So we just put it in there. And yes, these are kind of meant to just go in and never come back out. So that being said, they are a pain in the butt to get in and out. But once you get it in, at least you rest assured knowing you never have to worry about it again. Now this one's actually kind of nice because it's got kind of a foil cushion. So. Now that it's all nice and in there, it's nice and snug, we can move on. So, keeping the camera back in the tripod, we can move on to the next step of getting the motherboard into the case. You don't simply screw a motherboard into 
a computer case. And here's why. The case is metal. That being said, the back of the motherboard, as you've seen, has metal. And soldered connections, and yada yada. You don't want metal on metal, bad. So you have these, they're called standoffs. Now, depending on your motherboard determines where you put these standoff screws into the case. We've already gone ahead and put the standoffs where we need them to be. And essentially, there's already screw holes in the motherboard in which you screw into the standoffs. Now, cable management is another thing we're also going to get into. You notice there's a bunch of these cables, and we're going to route them later. But for now, we're going to kind of just put them aside so that we can get them, or we can get the motherboard into the case. And really, there's no one particular way to do this, because it's all temporary for now. Okay, so, plugging my ESD band back up, we're going to put the motherboard into the case. And we're going to line up the holes on the I.O. shield and the standoffs. And we're going to look on the other side of the case to make sure everything in the I.O. shield is lined up and looks good and fits right and feels good. And we're going to make sure all of the standoffs line up and look good. All right. So the case or the motherboard is in the case. So, now, we're going to screw it in. Now, not just any screws are going to fit the motherboard in. They have a particular shape, and most of the time, they kind of have like a hexagonal kind of shape. <clears throat> Generally, I like to go for the easiest corner screws. on one side and then I go to the corner screw on the other side and this basically ensures that it does not shift and don't worry if you don't get the screw in the first time because even an experienced technician has times where the screws fumble around it just happens that's why we have tweezers I happen to use Hosan ESD safe tweezers they work great, and because they're ESD safe, they do not transfer any electricity. So basically, we continue to screw in all the parts where we see standoffs. Until it's securely in. And you don't want to skimp out on these standoffs because these support the motherboard so it does not bend. If the motherboard bends, it can crack. If it can crack, it can have micro fractures or worse, a straight up fracture. In which case, let's just say you're going to have a bad time. And you'll notice some of these standoffs can be in an odd position. Kind of develop your own technique on getting these in. Sometimes you want to use a long screwdriver, sometimes you want to use a short screwdriver. Hey, whatever tickles your fancy. So, now that we've got all those in, okay, we've got one more screw to go. We have all of them. We have just completed another step. In this case, the motherboard is now connected to the case.
Okay, so now we're gonna put the RAM in. And as you noticed, the fans are not on the heat sink yet. And this is actually for a good reason. The fans are a bit cumbersome and can get in the way of a few connections. So we're actually gonna put the fans in last. So, as you can see, the heat sink actually uh, sits a bit above the RAM. And before we put the RAM in, we're once again gonna put the ESD connection, or the ESD band, back on my wrist for safety reasons. And we've got our four sticks of RAM. So we're going to remove it from the package. We've got our Kingston HyperX RAM, 1600 megahertz, eight gig sticks each. And once again, we want to remember that the RAM is keyed. So that way you can't put it in the wrong way. Keep this in mind, you do not want to jam the RAM in the wrong way. You will damage it that way. So keeping that in mind, you also want to keep that in mind that this is dual channel RAM. And thus, you want to look on the motherboard for the correct dual channel slots if you're not filling all the slots. So cameraman, if you could be so kind as to bring the camera over to the motherboard. You'll see that these are color coded. One is black, one is red. If you want to have dual channel capabilities and you have two sticks of RAM, you will fill the red and the red. You do not fit side by side. Each color shows a particular channel. So with that being said, if we wanted to have dual, cap dual channel capability on strictly black, we would first pull the notches back on the RAM channels Sometimes they can be fussy because it's so brand new and hasn't been moved in basically ever. And actually in this motherboard, the, the uh, back one does not move. Which you've actually been seeing that more and more often in newer motherboards. So if you're more of an old school guy like me, you have to kind of get used to that. So when you fit that in there, you push down and it locks in. So, that's our first sticker RAM, and once again, it's important to do a check to make sure it's fitted. And because the bottom set does not move out, it's important to check that it's fitted, because if we look around here, if we take the camera and move it here, you'll see that it's actually not fitted. So moving the camera. This is an important lesson you don't want to learn the wrong way. You see that it's not flush. If you start the computer and it's not flush, you can have some problems. And this is why I don't particularly like the kind that don't move back. And it's weird that some of these don't move back like that. When clearly, these ones move back, these ones don't. I'm not sure why manufacturers are doing it like that sometimes. Fitting it in properly is key. So now, if we do an inspection, we'll see that it's properly fitted. So now, there's no gap. My cameraman zooms in. You can see the gap is gone. Nice, proper fitted connection. Don't do it the wrong way. You'll learn a very painful lesson. So, moving on. To continue with our concept of dual channel, once again, we match up the colors. So we fit the black on black. And most of the time, You'll hear a click and a click. Once again, we check to make, make sure it's fit. And it's fit, and it's clicked in, and it's level, and it's secure. And that would be dual channel on the black. In contrast, if you wanted to do it on red, you would shift it over to red. Now, because we're using all the slots we are going to just move this over for the sake of convenience. 
to red. And because we're going to be using dual channel on both, and even though is the other one doesn't move up and down, it does still have a click. And you got to make real sure that you hear the click, and a visual inspection is always nice so a flashlight is handy and sometimes when RAM isn't seated correctly you can have a no post error so it's really important to make sure you check the seating of these so the seating looks good as far as I can tell And we're going to move on to the next one. My cameraman can confirm when he zooms in that the seating looks good. Does it look good to you, cameraman? Mm-hmm. All right. Sometimes in a tight space like that, it can be a little hard to see with the naked eye. But it looks good to me. It looks good to my cameraman. We're going to continue with the next two sticks. Click. Click. You hear the two clicks, and even though I hear it audibly, I like to check it visually every single time. And the one way to tell is that they're all level. When one is incorrectly, you can kind of tell the other ones are in too. We get the next one, check the key. correctly and the RAM is in place. That step is now complete. Cut. Okay so the next thing we're going to put into the uh, case is the hard drive. Now our case has a nice toolless design which uh, basically makes things a lot easier. Now in my opinion based on your case you want to put your hard drive in a particular spot. If you look here We've got a nice 230 millimeter fan. Now, because of the way the fan is, the main flow of the air is going to be on the top of the fan or the bottom of the fan, not the center. So when I place a high performance hard drive like this, and because it's 10,000 RPMs, it will be producing a lot of heat, I would rather have it on the bottom end of the case because of two reasons. One, cold air resides on the bottom of a room. And because of that, we often see uh, case fans that intake cold air on the bottom. And as far as the fan goes, uh, we have two choices in which the airflow is going to come in through the fan. It's not going to be in the center, it's going to be in the top and the bottom. And the obvious choice overall is going to be the bottom. So, of all of these uh, toolless design uh, case as, cases for the hard drive, I'm going to choose the bottom for uh, our hard drive. So uh, we have the hard drive itself and as you can see it has holes and normally uh, you'd be screwing these in manually into the case but because these have basically just a plastic flimsy not really it's flimsy but sh uh, sturdy kind of flexible plastic, we can kind of just place the holes or the screws over the holes and it holds itself in place. And this allows us to just place it back into its location and snap it back in, voila! our hard drive is in the case. Okay, so now we're gonna be focusing on one of the more difficult parts of building the computer, which is hooking up the front panel 
the front I.O. panel, actually. And uh, this may require you to go into your manual for your motherboard. So we're going to hook up the very basics first. Now, if you have USB 3.0 in the front of your case, you're going to be using a cable that looks like this. So, uh, it's a relatively new implementation. And if you use USB 2.0, you'll be using a cable that looks like this. So, first off, we're going to hook up USB 3.0 because this is a more modern computer. And the first connection is going to look like this. Now, it might not always be red, but uh, you'll also notice that it is keyed. See, it's kind of got a bump on the front cable here. And so will the connection be on the motherboard. So we connect the keys up, and we connect it, and that's how it should look. And you got your front panel USB 3.0 hooked up. Now, for those of you who have hooked up front panel USB 2.0, you're probably a little more familiar with what that looks like. Uh, let's try and get the wires a little more sorted here, and because there are a few of them on this case. So, cable management can kind of be a pain in the butt at first. So, getting them all sorted out ahead of time might tickle your fancy. So, we got two of them. Uh, actually, hold on. I had it just a moment ago. Ah, here you are. And you'll notice a lot of these look the same. And for instance, these both are USB, and they're clearly labeled as USB. But you'll notice this one is labeled AC97. And you'll be wondering, well, what's the difference between them? Well, they're clearly not for the same thing, and you can tell by the way they are keyed on the top. You see, this one has a total of eight pins, but one of them is blacked out in one section. And it's the same for this one, although one is blacked out in a different section. So basically, you, when you're hooking these up, you kind of basically just figure out uh, which ones have the same blackout spot. And generally on the motherboard, they will be clearly labeled as well. So looking at the motherboard, this is USB, and this is also USB over here. This one is a USB 3.0 slot, but since we only have one USB 3.0 uh, connection to hook up on the front panel, we're not going to worry about that one. So, uh, we're going to now hook up the front panel, USB 2.0, and we'll move some wires out of the way in a moment. And once again, we have this keying that we keep talking about. Keying is the process of making sure you can only put something in one way so that you can't screw up the connection. You know, so if it's nice and snug in there, that's one USB 2.0 connection. And this is the second USB 2.0 connection going in. And there you have that. All right, now we still have plenty of other connections to go. We're gonna start, or we're gonna continue with the more basic connections first. And we're gonna kinda get some of these out of the way. So, some of these were pre-braided to kinda keep them in order. kind of causes a few issues when switching up hardware like we did. Now, some motherboards still have connections for things like uh, HD Audio, AC97. This will be your connections for your front panel audio. So, um, 
you look for the blanked out spot and if we look here we kind of see that we have the blanked out spot we see that it fits now without looking at the motherboard manual we can't be 100 percent sure that that is it but there's a pretty good chance that that is in fact it and if you're too lazy, you can confirm when the computer's on that that is there. However, we are going to check the manual in a minute to make sure that that is in fact what we think it is. But generally, that keying is there for purposes like this, and you don't always and you don't have to have this AC97 when you have the uh, other audio cable in to make that work. And then we have these other cables over here. Uh, this is going to be our cable that provides our eSATA to our front panel. Now, you'll notice this is a regular SATA cable. Now, because this is a regular SATA cable, it does not provide the same plug-and-play capabilities that eSATA would normally have. So in order to make this work, when you plug an eSATA device in there, you have to go into Device Manager and detect the device manually. Keep that in mind. So... We're going to plug this in to any of these SATA ports, and although because these are angled, you can't see, but that went in nice and smoothly. And the only other cables we have are the 1394, which I believe this is for Firewire. And let's see what the king is. We have it on the very end. And I'm not sure if this motherboard has a 1394 connection for FireWire. So this may or may not have a compatibility. So we're going to keep this off to the side. In case you were wondering, FireWire was more a standard for Macintosh versus Microsoft. And FireWire is an asynchronous connection versus USB is a synchronized connection. So, we have these four wires here. And this is basically what you come to the manual for. Because these four little wires right here are kind of a pain in the butt to figure out where they go. We have the power switch, the hard drive light indicator, the power light indicator, and we also have the reset switch. Now, figuring out where these go can be easy or hard, depending on the motherboard itself. Sometimes the motherboard has good indications, and sometimes they don't. And uh, if you're looking close up, you'll see that we do have one extra screw to go right there. And before we lift the computer up, we will make sure that goes in there for anyone who's observant. Um, so, we do have indications right here that give us a pretty good idea of where these cables are going to go however because they're such tiny cables and connections I'm going to plug these in without the camera being in the way so we're gonna turn the camera off and we're gonna plug them in and we're gonna show you okay so as I was saying before one of the most difficult parts about setting up the computer is getting the front panel that powers the reset switch, the power switch, the hard drive light indicator, and all that stuff is, you know, all this stuff, getting it hooked up correctly. So this is the manual, and you need to consult this to figure it out, because there's a positive and negative leads that you need to, need to get hooked up correctly or else it doesn't work right. So this is the diagram, and this is what it looks like in practice. It's a bit difficult at first, and every motherboard is different, which is why you need to consult the diagram. And some motherboards are really simple because it shows directly on the motherboard exactly where to hook up, and other times, like in this case, you need to consult the manual. Okay, so now we're going to put the graphics card into the motherboard. There's one thing I want to bring up to you guys about this, though. Because this heatsink is large and is obviously made of metal, we once again have an issue with the fact that this is also solder and connections in the back. Now, normally this wouldn't be an issue to plug this in to the top connection, but as you can see, 
By doing so, we come dangerously close to the heat sink. And I don't like that because if for some reason we bump the computer and this creates a connection between the heat sink and the rest of this PCB, we may or may not have an issue. Although I've had scenarios before where we've become dangerously close to this and never had an issue, I don't like to take those chances. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop it into the slot below. Some people may think it's silly to worry about that, but I don't like to have second thoughts. So as you can see, we just took out two of these uh, back slots right here, and these are basically what open up the ports for this to have access in the back. So we're going to gently line up the whole the slot for the PCI Express 16 times 3.0, in other words, PCI Express 16 times third generation connection. And because this is a toolless design, we can push this down and it locks into place. And the one thing I don't like about toolless designs is sometimes they're just not as secure as the tool designs. Nevertheless, once it's in, we check to make sure it's seated properly. And although it wiggles a little more, it's still in there. Now one thing to note about these connections is you notice we've got these big white fins down here. Not every motherboard has a big white fin, but nevertheless the idea is the same. When removing anything from a PCI Express 16x connection like a graphics card that uses the full capability of the slot, this locks it into place. Many times you'll have to push up on the top side of this connection to remove it. Otherwise, you will damage the slot and or the motherboard. So make sure that when removing any device, you're careful about that connection. So now that this device, this graphics card, is in its place, and although it wiggles a little bit, it is in there. And that's kind of the downfall of tool list designs is they're just not as secure as a screw. So that's why it wiggles a little bit. But there's not much you can do about that. So it's in there. And now that we have basically all the internal components that we need except the power supply, we're now going to put the power supply in as well as a few other wires and then we're going to put the fans on the heat sink in and then she'll be ready to be powered up. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the power supply. This is called a modular power supply as we said before because you can take parts of it off when you don't need to use them. Now on this power supply we still have connected at all times our 20 or 24 pin motherboard connection as well as a few other parts including our motherboard uh, power for our 8-pin, as well as a secondary 4 and 8-pin, and two 6 plus 2 graphics card power connections. Now, because our motherboard requires additional power, we have attached another set of a 6 plus 2, because the motherboard happens to use one of these for uh, more power. Now, in addition to the things we need to power, we are also going to attach some SATA cables as well as some Molex connections. So to do this, as you imagine, would be quite simple. You find a connection on the back and you plug it in. It really does not get much more simple than that. Any connections you don't use, you keep the rubber connection or the little rubber uh, plug on top so that it doesn't get dirty. Connection stays clean, doesn't have any issues. Once the connections are nice and snug, you're ready to put the power supply in. So, when putting the power supply in, make sure all the other connections down here are not in the way because you don't want to undo those or bend anything down there. 
Now you notice that this power supply does have a fan. Most power supplies do come with fans nowadays. It helps keep them cool and efficient. So I'm going to drop this in here. You see we got a bunch of wires going everywhere. Now if a cameraman would come over to the left here, we'll notice in the case that we've got screw holes. This is where you secure the power supply. So we're going to first start by taking one of the holes and lining it up. I'm going to screw it in by hand just so we can kind of get it in there. And sometimes, because it's on a kind of a funny angle, getting it in there just a little bit with a screwdriver doesn't hurt. Now that we got that one in just a little bit, we're going to go to the uh, diagonal connection or screw, whatever you want to call it. And we're going to anchor it in there with our screwdriver. It's kind of a basic rule of screwing anything in in a pattern. Just go up, down, and left, right kind of pattern. Make sure it's nice and in there. You notice we didn't go in this hole right here, and that this wasn't really a hole, it was just sort of a groove. It doesn't always have to be a hole depending on the power supply. Whatever it happens to go into is what it goes into. So don't be surprised if it's not a hole. Then we got our last anchoring point, which is right up here. Screw that in. Now on the back here, we have our on and off. And right here is actually not the switch to 120 and 240 volt. Um, other countries besides the United States have a different uh, AC system than what we use. Older power supplies, you had to manually select what it, what, you, what it was. And if you selected the wrong thing in the United States, you could seriously screw up everything. Nowadays, power supplies automatically do that for you. So, now that we've got all of that put in together, last thing we need to do is start hooking everything up. So, if my cameraman would start kind of hovering over the uh, computer case, we're going to start plugging things together. So, how you plug things in is kind of up to you in terms of what goes in first but uh, I kinda like to work my way top to bottom in some cases this case because this has got so many different types of connections I'm gonna kinda start left to right so because the motherboard requires this particular six pin. I'm going to plug that in first because that just tickles my fancy. You know what, before we do anything, this is a precaution, I'm going to reattach my ESD, my ESD band. My cameraman is going to get a better angle. You'll notice right down here, we've got that funny connection. And although the heatsink is big and in the way, this is a good example as to why we don't have the fans on yet. Because sometimes things just get in the way. And although we don't click in the place that's in there, Another good reason why we don't have this graphics card right in the way is in the first slot is because then we're blocking connections for easy access. 
So now that we got that connection in, we're gonna go and put these connections here. This is the four, and then this is, or this is the eight, and then the four. Now, uh, it's only been re relatively recently that higher end motherboards require more than a four pin power connection up here. So um, older power supplies do not have more than four. So uh, getting a new power supply might be necessary to accommodate for that. Lucky for us, we've already thought of that. So we're going to take our power, our power supply cables and kind of wire it on, on down there. Once again, managing the cables is kind of tricky if you've never done it before. And it also kind of depends on the length of the cables. Now, cable management can be a beautiful thing, provided that you can actually do it. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. When it is possible, it's great. And this case makes it possible most of the time, because if you look in here, you'll see that there's these holes. There's a hole here, there's a hole here, there, and there. That's actually for routing cables through the back of the case. And the reason you would route a cable through the back of the case is to allow airflow to be unrestricted by the cables that you have to use. So what we're going to do is we are going to try and route some cables, but unfortunately, actually, you know what? We can, we can route these cables. We're just going to have to use the lowest routing possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to stand the case up. And in order to route the case, the cables, we have to undo the back panel. Now to undo the back panel, there's going to be two screws holding it, just like the front panel. So when we remove the back panel, you'll see a bunch of the access points. And we're going to route it from here to up here. So, showing you exactly what I mean is we're going to kind of take these back here. We're going to gently pull them. We're not going to force them through anything. And we're going to bring them up here, and maybe they'll fit, maybe they won't. Let's see what happens. So if the cameraman will come over here. You'll see what I mean. So, you'll see we have very little slack. Now, will it still work? Barely. What we're going to do is we're going to tilt the cable a little bit. And that fits right there. And the other cable is going to come right around here. And we only need one of the eight pins. And we got this cable right here. And that is how you route a cable. So if we go back to the back, we see we got kind of a taut connection, but we also see that we got some loose connections here. We can use some zip ties to tie these down, or we can also use some electrical tape, whatever kind of jerry-rigged way you want. Now, if you got a long cable, you kind of just need to find your own way of making sure that they fit because you don't have too much room once that back panel was back on. But routing cables is a great way to make sure airflow still has its way of getting from the front to the back of the case. So we're going to continue to route some cables. The next cable we're going to route happens to be the main power cable, which is this guy right here. This is the 20 
to, or 24 pin cable. Now not all motherboards require all 24 pins, but this motherboard does. So instead of just sloppily putting it right in there like putting it in there like that, that's going to cause some airflow restriction. So what we're going to do is we're once again going to route it out the back. And then we're going to bring it in through here and we're going to twist it just a little bit, plug her in nice and good and then plug that last four in and voila she's all nice up in there and that's how you route that now these cables ain't too long your cables are probably going to be a lot longer in a modular cable system for some reason they just ain't very long that's one of the downfalls of modular power supplies I've used to I actually uh, generally use ones from Corsair that are not modular and in my experience they are a lot longer but then they're also a lot harder to tuck away when you don't need to use them so now that we've got those all plugged in we've got uh, our power to our graphics card that we need to plug in now now these can't really be routed because our power supply power is right here it doesn't make sense to route them anywhere and luckily our power supply is relatively efficient so we don't have to use all eight of each of these pins and these are relatively low laying anyway so they can be nice and tucked kind of down there as it is the last things we need to power are the SATA connection to the hard drive and then the Molex connections to the fans. After all that's plugged in and then after the fans themselves for the heatsink are plugged in the computer will be ready to be powered on. So next we're going to route the SATA connection for the hard drives through the back of the case once again. And although since the one connection area is kind of bogged with a bunch of cables, we're going to route it through this hole to make it a little easier. Now, I am actually going to physically move myself back here so I can see what I'm doing. You may notice we have two hard drives, but actually we're only going to be using one. Now. We have not yet plugged in the SATA cable for the data connection, so we're going to plug that in. Now also you'll notice the data cable is keyed. So we're going to look for the keyed section on the hard drive. We're going to plug that in, and we're going to route that through the same place where we have the power going through. We'll plug that into the motherboard on the other side once we get there. And then while we're back here, we are going to try and use the bottommost plug, since this is the bottommost power. Although sometimes you may find that the bottommost plug might not make the most sense due to the way that they're keyed. See, the bottommost plug, because the way it's keyed, fits in like that, then you have to route the wires like that. So, in this case, we're going to use the topmost plug. And sometimes it doesn't always work like that. Okay, so now we're going to plug the SATA cable into the SATA port. Sometimes these things can be a little difficult to get in when they're at an angle like this because you can't see which way the direction of the key is. So don't be too frustrated if you can't get it in the first time. So we're going to plug it in. Luckily for us, it can't get in the first time. We're just going to put that in over there like that. So now our main hard drive has got power, it's connected to the motherboard, and now all we got really left to do is plug the fans in as well as connect the fans to the heatsink. 
So before we connect the power to the fans, we're going to hook the fans up to the Noctua D14. Now first up, we've got the larger one of the fans, which goes in the middle. So we're going to try and fit this like this. Getting it, it is not too hard. Just kind of snaps in there, and it stays pretty snug. Next up, we've got the 120 millimeter fan, which is a little smaller, and it goes in the same way. So we're going to set it up. We're going to snap it in, snap, now we've got all these connections in which we need to plug into the power supply. Okay, so now that we've got some miscellaneous power connections plugged in, such as the two power connections for the fans, which this motherboard actually has two CPU fan connections which are located at the top here. And note something that um, you may not know, is uh, some motherboards will refuse to boot the computer or start the computer at all without a CPU fan connected. This is a safety feature to make sure that the uh, CPU doesn't overheat. Uh, we also have uh, some chassis fans connected. And as you'll notice, some of them are uh, somewhat daisy-chained here. And this is a common practice. This is generally okay as long as you don't overdo it. Uh, the final step we're going to be doing is actually plugging it into the power system. So we have the root connection here. And we're just going to, whoops, we're going to plug it in. And now we have power to all the uh, system fans except for the door fan over here which we are actually going to plug in separately and we're going to tuck all the uh, connections that have the bottom here and we're going to disconnect my ESD band from the bottom of the case we're now going to put the side panel back on the case. But before we do, as I mentioned, it doesn't have a fan on the side, so we're going to plug that up. And we're just going to connect it there. And our panel has thumb screws, so it's nice and easy for quick access in the future provided we should ever need to do that. And sometimes thumb screws aren't so easy to get in and a screwdriver is necessary. Now, for the back panel, this can be a little tricky. Um, the thumb screws for the back panel sometimes require a little force. And where are the thumb screws, Jason? The back panel? Right here. All right. One. It's one thumb screw for the back panel. Now, if we have a little bit of a clutter in the back here, sometimes we need to just kind of tuck it away because we don't really have too much room in the back. And it really kind of depends what you want to do here. This is a SATA cable for power, so we're actually going to tuck for future purposes the SATA cable and the rest of the SATA compartment. So we've got a lot of a lot of cables back here. And we're going to make sure it fits without constricting the cables too much. And yes, we can in fact fit it without constricting the cables too much. And you'll know you're constricting the cables too much if you can't screw these 
this thumb tack in or this uh, thumb screw in by hand. So now we have the computer system completely built and all we got to do now is power it up to confirm that everything has been put together correctly. Okay, now that the computer has power and we have a monitor hooked up, Jason, if you would like to do the honors of turning on the computer for the first time, we have power. Let's see if we get a signal. Did you make sure to actually plug the monitor up? Let's double check the connections. Oh no, we have we have connection. It just took a moment. Republic of Gamer. Everything's working. Well, my friend, we have successfully built a computer. I just think that it took a moment to kind of boot up there for a second. Alright, well, everyone, that is how to build a computer from scratch. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please comment, rate, subscribe, show your friends, check out my other videos, got plenty of them. And thanks for watching.